All right, we've done a lot of programming stuff. We've done a little bit of sequence animation, but now let's do something a little bit more artistic, and that being lighting and a little bit of post processing involved with that as well. A lot of color related work. But before we do any lighting, there's one thing that I would recommend you do, and that is come into your project settings. If you don't have a tab for it, you can go to edit and then project settings. And in that we'll look for auto exposure and turn that off <laughs> because otherwise your camera will always automatically try to compensate for a space being either dark or light and that gives you a harder time to work with the lighting up an area to the point where you actually have it the way you want it to look like because if you want something to be a little bit more dark and mysterious the auto exposure will likely mess that up quite a bit so turning that off, you can immediately see things in this box. I did a little bit of level design stuff off screen to make this work a little bit better. Uh, it's a lot darker. When we go out here, we can see immediately it's a lot lighter. This looks a lot more pleasant, at least to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the lighting and then the post-processing. So first and foremost, let's go through some lights. I have a short video that explains what all these different lights do, so I'm going to go through them real quick. The directional light, we already have one, that is more or less a sunlight. That's a light that casts light from the same direction over your entire level. So no matter how far you walk in a certain direction, the shadows will always fall in the same direction. So you can see the shadows always fall, in this case, from that direction to here. If I go into my directional light, I can change its rotation to change how those shadows fall. And it works like any other object. We can change the rotation however we want. In this case, it's also linked to the skybox dynamically to make it match with the time of day that an angle like that would give. So. That's mostly to do with the Y rotation. And actually, I think I quite like the idea of having, let's see, the sun is over there now. Maybe having the sun coming all the way from somewhere over here. I quite like that idea. So that makes things even a little more dark in here. Gives us even more reason to be lighting it up manually. So then we make our way out here, and we get to this, like, sunset-type deal as far as looks go, which I quite like. I'm going to lower the intensity to 5, though, to make it a little bit darker, and then we'll move on to some of the other things that we already have in our scene. One of them is the exponential height fog, which you can actually see quite well here what that does. If I turn it off, you will see that a lot of the light scattering, the slight amount of rays that we have here. You can see it a little bit better through this object disappear, as well as the entire bottom part of our world. That entire thing is called just through scattering of light. If you want that to be a little bit more accurate, you can enable a volumetric fog, which makes that more physically accurate, but this is very much more computing intensive to run. So if this looks good enough to you, you should stick with that. The sky atmosphere is the air itself, so if we turn that off, you can see everything goes black as well. These two things together kind of make the basic setup of any world that you have. The skylight takes in either a cube map, or in this case is real-time captured, and uses the skybox to cast light onto your scene. So if we turn that off, you can see the little bit of light that our skybox generates disappears. And this is generally good for creating a baseline brightness in your scene. So if you want nothing to be absolutely pitch black, that's kind of what a skylight is generally good for, because it doesn't cast shadows usually. And then volumetric clouds aren't really light related, but of course, that's those clouds that we see. So those are the things that I'm not going to be adding on my own. That's what these template maps come with by default. Going back inside, I think it's time to go through some of the lighting options that we have. That being the point light. As you can see, it emits a light from a point. And here we go through some of the options as well. 
So we have the intensity. I think that's pretty straightforward. That's just how intense the light that it emits is. The light color, you can make it literally any color that you want. Let's just keep this one on green. Now, next, the attenuation radius is how far the fall off of the light reaches. You might think, why is this not just infinite? And as soon as an object is too far away, it shouldn't be lit by the thing just based on the intensity anymore, right? And if you're working on something like Blender, that is very much the case. But we're trying to work with something that is real time here. And as such, we specifically with lighting need to be cognizant of the fact that lighting can be a pretty heavy operation to compute. So the less your radius is for affecting things around you, the cheaper it will be to compute. So keep this as small as is possible for any given light. Sometimes it does need to be huge, don't get me wrong. But if it doesn't need to be huge, you don't want it to be huge. We can also use a color temperature, which just makes it a warmer or a colder color. And if you don't exactly know what that means, warmer colors are more orange, colder colors are more blue. That's a thing in cinematography, because if you are using artificial lights, oftentimes those are warmer, and cameras, and in this case, your game engine will need to know how to deal with that, while sunlight usually ends up being maybe a little counterintuitively colder, more blue. And you can test this out yourself if you have a camera where you can set the white balance to something manual, set it to something where it looks good inside your house and then take it outside you'll see the pictures you take with it are really really blue and that's aside from the actual color of the light so that influences the color that you choose the light to admit it's an option that you can use i generally just stick with light color because we don't need to get too technical about the cinematography here you can turn off effect world don't know why you would do this but it's certainly an option uh something more useful though is turning off casting shadows because of all things Casting shadows is one of the most computing intensive things of calculating lights because just calculating, okay, what is in this radius and we'll add a certain value to these textures is not that intensive. It's the calculating of the shape of the objects in the way and how they cast shadows that actually gets very intensive. So again, if you want to optimize your lighting and you have a light that doesn't need to cast shadows, turn this off and then we have the uh, volumetric scattering and indirect lighting intensity indirect lighting intensity is just how much you light things up through bounce light i believe and then you have volumetric scattering intensity and that is coming back to if we go into the exponential height fog what i showed you before the volumetric fog option if you turn that on, and I will put this in a little bit of a more normal color <laughs> and turn down the intensity a little bit as well. You can see there's a little dot over here, and that is because this light is scattering through the fog. So if we increase that scattering intensity, you can see that that little foggy dot that we have here becomes more obvious, especially against the darker background. And then if you want that effect to be even stronger, you can also increase the effect from the uh, volumetric fogs side, I'm pretty sure, through the scattering distribution. So now we have this very, very obvious, like almost lens flare looking thing. But that's not what we're doing here today. So the moment I turn off volumetric fog, that entire setting literally does nothing. And all the other options that we have here aren't too relevant for right now. You can say the maximum draw distance. So if you are a certain distance away from it, it should stop emitting light. Again, it's a performance thing, all that kind of stuff. We have light functions and light profiles and stuff. We're not going to talk about any of that right now, today. So the different types of light, let's talk about that for a moment. We have this point light. Then we have a spotlight, which does exactly what you imagine it to do. Instead of casting light in all directions, it casts light in the direction that it's facing. So if we go to the point light, we can rotate this thing around, but it literally does nothing, of course, because it's casting light in all directions. 
If we rotate this thing around, however, you can see that it's definitely doing things. We're going to go back to minus 90, though, because it shows some of the other things that I want to show off a little bit better. We have the attenuation radius, but here we have some other options as well, that being the inner cone and the outer cone. The distance between where the inner cone ends and where the outer cone ends is the fall off distance of the light. So the light will be at its most intense all throughout where the inner cone shines. And I'll go a little bit closer so that you can see the different lines. Those blue lines, those darker blue lines are the inner cone. And the outer blue lines, the lighter ones, are the outer cone. So if I make those really close, you can see that the fall off here becomes very sharp and it's a very obvious circle. The inner cone is very small and the outer cone is very light. The fall off is very gradual and it's a very soft light. In much the same way, we also have rectangular lights, which don't cast in a cone. Well, let's also put that at minus 90 degrees so that it's facing the ground here. But instead they cast light in a square. And here we have the width and the height of that square or rectangle in this case. And this can be really nice to light up things like uh, an entire hallway with just one light. Because just calculating this one light in this shape is a lot better than putting in a lot of point lights to light up a similar area. And you can tell that this is a pretty soft kind of light. So even if we increase the intensity, the, the fall off of it by default is really really soft there we have the barn door angle it's set to 90 degrees so that's kind of like the fall off of this type of light but if we all the way get that back to zero you can see that these barn doors as they're called are, are now pointing straight downwards i'll show you from this angle again how they move and the longer they are the more focused this light becomes as well so now you can definitely see what this does just like that we are focusing the light in a much more rectangular shape. And now we have a more rectangular shape of light. So those are the three types of main lights. They're rectangular lights, they are point lights, and they are spotlights. Point lights being the most computing intensive usually, the other two being, I believe, pretty similar in their intensity. But point lights also the easiest to just place around and have fun with. So let's do some of that. We'll put in a rectangular light in our starting area over here. So we'll put that at minus 90. We'll pull that up a fair bit and then just make this source about the size of our starting area. The barn door length will go up a little bit and we'll try to focus it down a little bit more, increase the intensity. And we can just play around with things a little bit like this. Maybe we want to focus it down even a little bit more. That's a pretty good start. And then let's use this point light as a base. I want to make this a little bit more bluish purplish for just like atmosphere reasons, right? Decrease maybe the intensity ever so slightly and start placing some of these around our walls. Now, there's one thing that you should note because we have three types of lighting and i'll explain those to you in a moment once i have uh, a couple more lights set up here because you'll be able to see what they actually do and how differently they function now everything we have at the moment is set to a stationary light is that true for the rectangular light as well it's also set to stationary so there's a couple of different ways you can deal with lighting in a game engine. Static lights get baked down, which means that they actually don't get rendered as lights at all. They just get baked down into textures that the engine then overlays on top of the actual textures of all of the models in the scene. So it gets calculated once before the game is even compiled and built and sent out to the players. And then on the player's end, it doesn't need to calculate anything ever again. It's really fast for rendering. So static lighting we generally use for lighting that is only really meant for the environment itself. Because as soon as even something like a player walks under a static light, that player is not a static element. And as such, it won't have that light baked onto it. So that's generally what we use that for. Things 
a light that's just supposed to light the environment in a static way. Next up, we have stationary. Most of your lights will be stationary, usually. That's why it is the default option. This is kind of a mix between static, which is entirely baked, and a movable light, which is entirely dynamic, calculated in real time. If there is something that this can bake onto, a static mesh, which is static, something that doesn't move, it will use that baked lighting. If there is something that moves around, like the player or like these blocks over here, it will see, oh, wait a second, this is not a static object. So I will not use the baked lighting for it. I will use the real time lighting for it. So it's a very intelligent kind of light. Since it still partly relies on being able to use static baked light, you can't move the light source itself. Which is why the last one is called movable and not something like dynamic. Because this is totally dynamic and is able to be moved around as the light source itself. So if you've got something like a disco light or uh, whatever, something like that, a spotlight that's like searching through an area and you want it to be an actual light, you would set that to movable. You do want to be careful with having too many movable lights in one scene because it will tank your frame rate really, really quickly. Again, most of the things that we want to use are stationary because generally we want to bake where it's possible for faster rendering, but most lights you still want to be able to influence at least the player, right? And the player is not a static object. So let's play through this and just see what this looks like right now. We can see if we go up in the corner here, it's all dark, and then in the light here, it's a little bit lighter, and we've got this cutscene, which looks a lot better now, with a little bit of lighting applied, and now we have our sunset at the outside, and it's all just kinda neat and nifty. So, let's just die, I suppose. <laughs> and when we get up here, we can see when we get to the purplish lights, that casts a very nice light on the player itself when we get close to it and we might need to have another rectangular light here rotate that down to the floor and maybe just for a little bit of fill lighting and let's make this like ever so slightly green maybe ever so slightly green seems about right that seems fun and you will note that the intensity is the total intensity of the light. So if the light source, in this case, the rectangle becomes bigger, the light gets more spread out. And to get the same brightness out of your light, you need to increase the intensity. And I also need to increase the radius for this specific one. And now we have a nice little mix here. And we can see there's a lot of shadows going on from all of the lights. And we've got this green light and we've got these purple little highlights everywhere. And it is starting to look a lot more fancy than it was before. Now, I can talk about this all day, and you can tell I am a little bit more long-winded than I was before, because this is a more artistic kind of thing, and it's harder to explain all the proper uses of this. And I was planning on including post-processing in this video as well, but I'm looking at my recording, and it's already long enough as it is. So, we're going to go into post-processing processing in the next video. I'll explain what post-processing does, how you can use it, and how powerful it is, because you can make your entirely own custom post-processing materials, which is really exciting. For now, though, thank you for watching. I hope it was helpful. This is the basics of lighting in Unreal Engine, and whenever we get around to adding post-processing and adding a couple of materials to this stuff, this is going to start looking really, really cool. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thank you to Eleanor for supporting at the Cave Digger tier on Patreon.